So back with Julie Harrington, BHA Chief Exec, um, just continuing on some of the issues we discussed. And I wanted to ask you, um, what's your overall vision for British racing going forward? And are there any problems in particular that you're really keen to tackle? So I think number one, um, having a long-term vision is important because um, we need that North Star to aim for. Um, and I think trying to get um, everybody in the industry um, united behind um, the right size and shape of, of the fixture list is a really important one because it can be the cause of our most regular divisions and we need to speak with a single voice particularly to government we need to be attracting the future racing fan um, and um, and making sure you know it's our big shop window and making sure that we're mindfully looking at the fixture list um, on a longer term basis we have a, a team of really talented people here who know um, race planning, the fixture list inside out, and every year it's like putting together a 3D jigsaw puzzle. Um, and it, you know, it can be um, quite divisive in terms of um, you know who makes the decisions on on different parts of the fixture list. And if we can try and get a longer term view um, that puts the customer, um, the, the betting customer. The, the watching customer, those people who own horses and want to give them opportunities to race at, at the heart of it, um, then, then I think that's a, a really important area for me. Two things I want to zero in on. Um, I keep pressing up the fixed list, but it is so important. <laughs> um, just in general, actually, can ask you a question. Do you think we have too much racing in Britain on whole? So that is a hypothesis, isn't it? You know, right. you, you asked uh, um, me, me questions earlier on <laughs> about next year, mm. um, and a regular hypothesis you get from people is too much racing. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as keep the same amount of prize money, have less racing, and share it out, um, and each race will will go up by a factor. It just doesn't work like that because it's actually the volume of races that are run that generates more revenues through the levy, through media rights, and then that is um, you know, shared out. So less races in the short term will mean less revenues to go, to go round. And so, so you actually have to have a more sophisticated hypothesis. That it, it, have we got too much of a certain type of racing? Um, have we got um, uh, you know, the right racing for not just our current horse population, because you know, it, breeding is obviously a, a longer term return on investment, but you, will, you, you can see that over time, the number of horses bred at a certain um, you know, quality of horse is, 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 will fit the fixture list. So, um, so I think um, just too much racing um, is a bit of a sort of blunt argument, and I think we need to get a, a little bit more sort of nuanced in the questions we're asking ourselves. Okay, um, just on that, because there was something interesting you said there, but um, in the short term, there'd be a decrease in revenue to go around. Um, do you think a scenario in which some short term pain might lead to some long term gain um, if things go balanced out a bit? But is, there, is that feasible? I think it is, but I think it is going to um, need more people to share, particularly race courses, to share some of the revenues generated, sh to share the data on that, so that you can actually look at by ha by protecting, you know, a really compelling product mm. um, that you can show that over a period of time it will protect those protect and grow those other income streams. Um, and you know th there are elements of that that we we need to um, share that data and to, to help do the most rounded piece of work that we can. Okay. Um, something else uh, that you also mentioned earlier, which I've been hoping to touch on anyway, um, bringing the future fan through. Um, so, what do you think are good ways to get 
more young people racing um, and more young people as fans of the sport. So you're asking a 50 year old woman here. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, look, I know um, there's, there's been quite a lot of success in things like student racing um, groups. I think what's really important and, you know, I watched the presentation um, from some, some younger people um, a couple of weeks ago um, as part of the European and Mediterranean Horse Racing Federations where we're all coming together to, mm. to ask just these challenging questions. What's really important is it's not just seen as a booze up, mm. um, but actually you also help people coming through connect to you know, whatever might be, if there's a group of 110 of them just connect to whether it's the horse, whether it's they enjoy, um, you know, the puzzle of, of trying to find the winner, um, and they will be um, the people who will stay with the sport, um, rather than it just being a, a, about a, a sort of boozy day out. And I think it's really important that whenever we have um, those types of activities that we try and get mm. that customer that, that you know even if you're inviting them in for free you you know you you really giving them a great day yeah. out try and get them as close to the horse as possible because you know that, <laughs> that's what we that's what we all love try and get them as close to the sport if it's a jump race or a hurdle race get them down to the last fence try and get them as close to the finishing line or the paddock and i think you know it it's exciting and, and I think we need to um, portray that. I also think working with broadcasters um, is really important to make sure that the way our sport is presented on screen um, is in line with the, the way younger people consume media. Um, and, you know, I said you're asking the question of a 50 year old woman. You, you go, well, the production team in a lot of our broadcasters are having to sort of ask those questions themselves as well for very experienced people who've been in the industry a long time. But how do we present the sport the way that, mm. you know, my grandkids want to watch it, who, mm. who've never watched TV? You know, they're, they're just constantly um, looking at um, media or events through their devices, which, um, uh, and, in short clips as well yeah. so so um you know I, I think it's a big challenge for all of us but at least you know i think racing to be honest does um present itself in that way uh, whereas other sort of longer format sports maybe don't um you said something about free admissions and um again going on ticket prices but do you think that it might be it might be a wise strategy to push reduced, heavily reduced or free admissions more, especially for weekday fixtures, etc., uh, in the hope of getting um, better takings from, you know, people buying concessions and, and also boosting the on-course bookmaking industry because people have more money to bet with when they're there, stuff like that. Look, as I said earlier, that's a bit of a sort of overreach for the BHA. That's really um, a matter for, for the race courses, but I've been a marketeer for mm. most of my professional career where it's just good business sense to you know to have lost leaders when you need to have lost leaders to encourage people mm -hmm. to try your product but to also then spend money on, on yeah. other things while they're there to um, get those people to introduce other people to you you know so it, it, they're all the sort of classic tricks that not not tricks but they're classic ways that marketeers would um, grow a business you know it, all of our lives, whether we're in the supermarket or we're going to the pub, we know the sorts of things that, that will tend to work to get us to try something new um, and to keep our loyalty. Just moving on to a different area of um, racing, uh, but this has been an issue which has been growing for quite a while. Um, course management um, and particularly also the state of ground. Now we've had some unfortunate incidents recently um, where racing has to be abandoned because of horses sleeping on bends etc and, and there are a growing number of people who say that um, there's too much watering um, you know and, and that this leads to bigger risk when you get sudden rainfall um, how closely is the BHA watching this and um, 
are there any signs that you might call for a, a bit of a change in strategy? So we have a team of course inspectors. Those course inspectors work really closely with the race courses, as you can imagine, on ground. And I've been in racing for a long time, and periodically you do hear lots of people saying, oh, too much watering, too little watering, you know. Um, and um, I think the, the recent incidents that you're talking about, one of the first things for the course inspectors team was to look at, is there a common denominator? You know, so because that what you know over a four or five day period, that was quite um, a lot of coincidence. Mm. Wasn't Did there? they find the common denominator? No, uh, and I think uh, you know they're, they're doing more of a report on it. But um, I, I guess the common denominator, and um, you know some of some of your um, customers with longer memories, um, often in spring it's been an, an issue where you'll get horses slipping. Um, you'll, you know, early part of the growing season, you'll get a temperature change and a, a sort of sudden growth of fresh, lush grass. Um, and as you say, with either water or a bit of rainfall on it, um, um, you, you would often get slippage. Um, and, you know, one of the things that the race course inspectors will be looking at, um, you know, in some instances it may be that um, the construction of a bend um, may have been too tight. Or, but you know that's really for the race course inspectors and the race courses to work out. But ruling out that there isn't just something more at play here, or establishing if there was something more at play here was the, was their sort of first brief. Mm. And you know the initial findings are it's just really you know a weird coincidence that you have four in four days or five days. Just on that, um, when can we expect a sort of finished report, will it be pushed out um, via the press releases that you guys do on Twitter and such? I can't imagine that it's going to be, you know, a, 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 big, a big reveal. Report, but but, <laughs> yeah. but, but um, we'll, we'll get, presumably, a few pages or so looking into the, yeah. into the findings. Okay, any, any ETA on that or...? I mean, really, it's going to be for the, the race course inspectors to work through um, with the race courses, uh, oh. as you'd expect. So they're, oh. they're obviously going into a, a busy racing period at the moment. But if their initial findings had been there's something more at play here, I think you know you, you would be throwing more resource oh. at, at trying to get to the bottom of that. But I think it's, it's more about, um, uh, as I said earlier, just, just making sure that good practice is going on in, in all of those areas. Um, couple more things on the ground situation. Um, going stick readings that were considered to be good years ago can now have seemed to vary. They can be good to firm and we, we've seen some changes and I was just wondering, and maybe this is sort of a more personal question, but um, do you think generally speaking that we've got it in the right place with this, that, that, that Clarks of the course aren't leading too far one way or the other, that we're not sort of moving away from the ideal for good to firm ground, say, on, on the flat. Look, I, I would say that, um, you know, I'm, what, just over a year into the role now. Um, it hasn't been a major focus for me, so I haven't really um, spent a huge amount of time going into this. From my previous days in race course management, I probably mm. um, know when the going stick first came in. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I, I do know um, that agronomy, you know, is not an exact science. That, that, you, that the ground it is living, breathing thing. And, uh, and you know, it, you can't, pre it's part sort of part science, part art. Mm. Um, and so I think, whatever technology we put in play, we have to acknowledge that, um, that you will get variations in the ground. Um, I had a period of time away from racing, working in, in football, um, and where the field of play is far more finite, and that the UEFA um, sort of agronomy checks um, were um, you know, far more scientific for a much smaller field of play, and it was still a massive, um, you know, cause of debate. And then the weather would suddenly change, and what should have been a ten-metre ball roll only ended up as a six-metre ball roll. And you know, well, so I, I think, um, you know, working with the clerks, with the technology, 
continuing to improve the technology, um, I'm sure, is the way forward. But I have to caveat that with with saying that it's not been a massive focus in my first sort of 12 months in office. Um, obviously, joining at the tail end of the pandemic, it's been um, it's really about just trying to make sure that all of our revenue revenue flows are, uh, are getting back to normal, even though you know it's likely we're um, going straight into um, as you said earlier um, a, a recession if not something approaching a recession mm. um, I'm circling back on this but uh, <laughs> and I know it's, you're going to say oh god this again but one last thing on fixture lists um, do you think that going forward there might be a reduction um, not necessarily a scrapping but a reduction in the amount of summer jumping that we have and the amount of weather race that we have. I say this if only because small fields have been noticed a lot for summer jumping um, and usually small fields, people bring it up in the flat in summer, there's been some, a lot of summer jumping, small fields there and also a lot of people do gripe about the amount of weather racing they see on their screens. Uh, admittedly, we've got to have something for everybody um, but do you think possibly that going forward there might be a rebalancing? So I I, um, I'm not saying, oh God, here we go again, because I'm not surprised at the amount of questions you've asked in this area because it's really important. Mm -hmm. As I said before, it's our shop window um, and it's the way we present our product to the racing and betting public um, and having a, a, a really deep look at, at the types of racing and the volume and the horse population and all those things, including the, the, the revenue that that um, provides to the sport, whether that's through betting revenue or media rights revenue um, or gate revenue, um, then I, I think that's really important. Um, and you know, I, I'm not sure whether it was a bit of a loaded question. Do you think that we've got too much uh, of those two particular <laughs> not, types not for of me racing? To say. <laughs> no, no. Um, but. Um, you know, if you are following the smaller field sizes, then mm. that's ob there will obviously be the areas that you need to have a good look at because you need to get under the skin of of why are we having those smaller field sizes? Is it the ground? Is it you know, we've had much fewer ab abandonments from a jumping point of view um, this year than than in previous years, um, whereas. With, with a big abandonment year, the horses are condensed into um, fewer races, obviously. Um, so I, I think you're right in terms of following the data and the team here, um, you know, in terms of the data that is available to them, which, it, which tends not to be the sort of raw commercial mm. data um, on horse population and the, you know, at the different, um, types of horse, different grades of horse, different types of races, um, they're all, they've already modelled a huge amount of that through. Um, just to end this part, um, but we've talked a lot about various issues in British racing and also things that are done well and people put a lot of time and energy into that. When you look overseas, is there anything in particular that you think British racing could take um, from other jurisdictions, and if so, what? A betting monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you look at you look at the the um, jurisdictions who mm. um, are, are clearly, um, you know, out competing us in terms of um, prize money. Um, they they tend to be a more um, you know, a less fragmented market with more control of. Um, all of the income that's coming into the sport. Um, clearly that ship sailed in this country um, decades ago. Um, but uh, looking at how do we work with government to make sure that we, we don't fall further behind because we can't do that on our own. And last but not least, um, the gambling review. Uh, there's been quite a bit of concern that the level that a minimum stake is set at could have a massive impact on the sport. So two questions in one to end. Firstly, um, do you worry about the increasingly negative perception of betting 
um, outside of sports, and in some cases even inside sports, given racing's inherent links to it. And number two, um, is there anything that would particularly worry you as an outcome from the gambling review? So of course I worry about the negative perception of betting. I, I am a betting fan. Um, I It's part of my leisure repertoire. I, I can't bet on horse racing while I'm doing this job, um, but I certainly have a lot in the past. <laughs> um, and um, and I, I think it, it's an enjoyable and responsible um, use of my leisure money. Mm. Um, I think it's incumbent on all of us, whether whether we're betting operators or the BHA, to make sure that we're doing what we can to promote. Um, I don't like the term responsible gambling, but that w that we well, are. What, what would you call it? <sighs> it's difficult. You really have put me on the spot there. <laughs> uh, but, but basically, that we're doing all we can to to ensure that we're protecting those people at risk of of problem gambling. So whether that's on our race courses, whether that's through um, you know, voluntary codes of practice, um, without the need for um, sort of government intervention. Um, and I think I'd be naive not to, not to be worried about elements of, of the Gambling Act review um, and you know, making sure that we are in really good and deep, detailed conversations with government about any unintended consequences um, has been a real priority for me in the first 12 months in role. Um, because what, what you don't want is them to put something in there for, you know, which might be a vote pleasing um, mm. um, tactic or, or, or policy, and them not be aware of. You know, a, a massive impact that it could have on a sport that has got such a symbiotic relationship with the betting industry. Mm. Well, thank you very much, um, and look forward to part three with you, Julie Harrington. Thank you. Thank you.